Hello, welcome to the University of Cambridge Centre for Creative Writing and a series of conversations with writers. I'm Midge Gillis and today I'm talking to Dr Lucy Deneen. Lucy and I both teach at the Institute of Continuing Education. Lucy is also an award-winning short story writer, poet and writer of non-fiction. In this conversation I talk to Lucy about the lyric essay, what it is and what makes it so versatile and appealing to both the writer and the reader. We recorded this conversation during lockdown and we touch on writing and research during the pandemic and missing favourite writing locations. Lucy also offers advice on preparing submissions and how powerful experience finds a way into her work. First of all, tell me what a lyric essay is. Um, a lyric essay, um, well, the interesting thing about the lyric essay is that nobody can fully De decide on a, a sort of one standard definition of what it actually is. So there's a wonderful lyric essay by uh, John um, de Garter called, we might as well call it the lyric essay. And it's, mm -hmm. it's basically an essay about what we should actually call these, these strange things that we're, we're doing because they're not journalistic and they're not, um, they're not sort of pure memoir or biography or something along those lines. They're this strange kind of in-between thing which is borrowing a lot of the techniques of poetry, a lot of the techniques of literary fiction, but they are non-fiction, but they're not, they're not the sort of the, of the kind of really line level fact checking. Yeah. Sort of journalistic where you need to be sure that everything you're saying is as true as it can possibly be. There's a certain element of impressionism about, about mm. the lyric essay and sort of piecing together things in a way that feels true, but, um, might perhaps recreate things in a slightly more um, yeah, creative context. So they're, they're a really interesting form and I love them because they can be, I mean, the one I'm working on at the moment is going to hit about 9,000 words, I think. Oh my goodness. So it's right. long, it's a long thing. Um, but they can be, they could be 500, 1,000 words. Mm. So. But it sounds like it kind of uh, plays to your strengths and all the things you really like doing, like poetry and short fiction and nonfiction. Why are you yeah. smiling? Yeah, because because actually now you say that, I sort of think in a way it's great because it's like um, when you get a little bit frustrated with poetry, and often I find a lyric essay for me accidentally comes out of a poem that's not working properly. Oh. And I'm trying to work out what's wrong with the poem and why isn't it coming together, and then I switch it. In fact, this this piece that I'm working on, it's um it's called um, My Love Is a Shark, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a it's about a number of different things from from um, neonatal death, which is very sad, obviously, to shark fishing, to to travel. So it's got a lot of strands and mm. Heidegger and um, phenomenology is, is in there. And, and I'm trying to pull all these different things together. And in a in a poem, it failed horribly. It was just a mess of too many competing ideas, mm. didn't know what it was trying to do. But then I, I think it was actually because I saw um, a call for submissions for an essay, which seemed to fit what I was doing. And I thought, I wonder if I could steal bits of this poem to turn it into an essay, which felt a bit of a cheat, but, um, but it was a really obvious transition once I started to do it. And I thought actually it was wanting to be an essay all along. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, there's a wonderful um, sort of reminder from Cheryl Strayed, who talks about the essay form when she reminds us that the word essay itself comes from from that sort of to try to test to attempt so i think there's something about that feeling with a lyric essay that you don't necessarily have to know where it's going to end mm -hmm. or what it is you're trying to find when you're doing it uh -huh. you, you get inside it and it it starts to show itself to you and and that's why it's great because you can yeah you can pull from all those other forms mm -hmm. and so it sounds like it, it might be a, a form for today because it's it is kind of um, loose in a sense, and you can just not know where you're going. And I guess at the moment we none of us know where we're going. No, exactly. Um, I think you have um, perhaps a starting point, and you have you have your sort of your red threads, as it were, to, to sort of lead you through the the forest. Um, but I think, and actually, for something I've I've realized over the last few weeks is how much of writing is about not writing as well mm -hmm. it's about a lot of that sort of the downtime when we're allowing ourselves to think and and percolate ideas mm -hmm. and we can get very um 
very anxious to get onto the page too fast in a way yeah. and because we're having to slow down at the moment and because we're having this sort of strange enforced you know thinking time it's it's allowed a lot of the, the ideas to kind of um merge around in my head before i've put them onto the, mm -hmm. the page mm -hmm. um and and i think an essay is quite good for that because you are thinking of point by point by point and it's taking you through it quite um quite cumulatively you don't necessarily have to have a complicated plot or something that you need to know in advance you, you just you just sort of excavate it mm -hmm. from the text in a way so yeah it, it makes me think of you know that quote about the the pram in the hallway means you're not going to write but I, which is true in a physical sense but i think that um when you do have a baby you're still thinking about things and things are yeah. percolating in the same way when my daughter was born i wrote more than i'd ever in the first 10 weeks of her life i think i wrote more than i've ever written at mm -hmm. any one time and it was probably better than a lot of stuff i've written mm -hmm. and anyway certainly so I, I mean are you finding it's good to write at the moment well I, I do a different kind of writing because I, I tend to do a lot of research first and so I'm doing different kinds of research but I am I feel desperate to write something so mm. um, I think that um, hopefully in the next few weeks I will find some time just to get something down because mm. I have got that urge um, so um, I think it's a, a form of kind of outlet and creativity that maybe has come out of this enforced isolation because you can't find creativity in the ways that would have been there in the past mm, that's that's really true yeah it's um it's an, uh, it's an interesting thing because there's that sort of competing desire do you want to write about what we're going through or do you want to write about something that's completely nothing to do yeah. with that at all? Yeah. You know? I, I definitely don't want to write about what we're going through but when i'm looking at the past which is i always write about the past i am you know, i'm thinking about it in the terms of what's happening today so today mm -hmm. makes me think about the second world war and yeah. about what children would have gone through then and about rationing and evacuation and things like that um and it also because I'm, I'm really interested in uh piccadilly circus at the moment and that makes me think of crowds mm -hmm. yes. and of how empty it is now and how mm -hmm. we're, we're we're being forced to come away from that and and not to touch and you know i don't know if you feel the same that when i read something or if i see something on the television i'm outraged that people are standing so close to one another or yeah. kind of showing that affection in a physical way and that just so quickly seems really alien it does i find funny you should say that because i was only thinking this morning about um piccadilly circus <laughs> i was thinking about the waterstone actually <laughs> um, and, yeah. um, and missing to go into waterstones um but but yeah that sort of strangeness of of, of crowds disappearing and um um and and a sort of a world that in the space of just a few weeks seems to be something that is part of a, a past that we now would fictionalize or or sort of almost mythologize in, in writing yeah. because it seems suddenly so far away yes so, yeah um so when I, I feel it will put writing in some way even if it's not directly won't it yeah yes the, the, the phds will be written in the in the coming years about <laughs> analyzing yes how writing has changed so yeah how does your your style your your approach to writing how has that changed the pattern of how you actually put it down on the the page or the computer i i suppose in a way i feel i've always felt a little bit as though writing had to be the thing that i had to make time for like i had to sort of carve out the space because there's always real life to to focus on and it's almost as if that's flipped over now so that I'm thinking to myself well there's a responsibility to fill some of the time we're not obviously working in our day jobs 24 7 so mm. the time that I might have been seeing friends or out with my children or just you know just being out and about it's like a sort of a compulsion to fill that with something valuable mm. so so I'm using my writing time or using that time to write um, which means that where I used to write when I felt I had something to say and it was sort of needing to come out now i'm yes. actually sitting down thinking right today i've got these hours and i'm going to fill them this way and um so it's it's kind of it, it's i think it's reinforced my sense of how important it is mm. right and why it's well, you, to do it. 
were you someone who would write in a cafe for example and outside has that changed yeah um and in fact i was just um i i saw very some very sad threads on instagram just yesterday from a number of writers who were were mourning their particular cafes but taking photographs of the spots through the window where they used to sit and um, um and it does feel like a kind of a, a mourning because i think we we develop quite particular patterns and, and mm. as writers that we've talked about this before we can be quite superstitious can't we about how we yeah. how we um set out our working environment or how we get to work so to sort of not be able to go to these these places that have become like talismans or um so i hold my lucky table in the corner of the cafe yeah. or even just the fact that it's somewhere that it's part of a routine so yeah. you know, you know it's your brain switches into that kind of mode um i don't I, it was never my main way of writing i have to say but i do miss the possibility of doing it or or just to go and sit at, i sit at the beach and and oh. friends, um which is, is quite sad not to be able to do that um yeah it's, um and yeah. so you said you've written was it seven thousand words or was it I've more than about, that i've written about seven thousand and i think i think the essay is climbing to between nine and ten thousand it's a big right. a big thing but, um so that's that's a bit troublesome when it when because publications don't often yeah just lengthy pieces and, and will there not come a point where you think oh maybe this should be a novel rather than a lyric essay does that ever happen i've already thought that yes <laughs> it's all it's funny because you can grow from something very small like a poem or actually even smaller um um just a, an image and mm. um it started because i was working on a, the translation of a german poem or an Aus austrian poem but translating from german um and the, the poem is called my life is a shark but when i wrote down my notes my handwriting so bad um i translated the title as my life is a shark but i i read it as my love is a shark and then i thought okay that's that's something i like i'll take that and keep it for later mm. um and then last year I was in um, Amman for a few days hmm. um, on my way to Australia and I was on a boat trip and when we came back from the boat trip there were many many fishing boats in the harbour and lots of sharks had obviously gone on a big shark fishing yeah. Yeah. trawl and all of these shark carcasses were all over the harbour and we were hurried away from it very quickly um, but it sort of stuck with me this this these sharks and I then started reading about the, the shark fishing um, traditions in in Oman and it's it's very it's a very key part of the way of life mm. very sort of bound up with it's actually very bound up with community as well so obviously we feel very conflicted about the ecological aspect of it and the fact the sharks are endangered and they're being fished to, to sort of dangerous levels of, of um, you know pushing them towards potential extinction but at the same time this is very much part of community life and the relationship mm. between shark and fishermen is actually quite an intimate one in a, in a strange mm. way so do they do something in iceland sorry to interrupt do they do something similar in iceland do they have sharks um, in iceland have i just imagined that i remember seeing well, well the sharks they 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 there's the putrefied shark that's that's eaten yes um, isn't there a whole um, tradition attached to that a bit, i think so um all I know about that is a, an Icelandic friend who told me that to get the putrefied shark, sharks excrete their urine through their skin, um, oh. and um, they don't. I don't think they have bladders or something, or it just it has to come out through the skin. So you um, you have to bury the shark, so the urine dead shark kind of yeah. sort of soil, and then then you can eat it. Right, I'm making some of that up as well. No, that's that's all coming back to me now. Yeah. But, yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so are you influenced by um, essayists from the past or you, you know, like Orwell or, or even 19th century writers or are you very much a kind of modern lyric essayist? I think probably both. I mean, I think we, I think it's impossible not to be influenced by Wolf in this matter. Um, yeah. it's, it's everything to me comes back to, to Virginia Woolf. Um, and, and what she had to say about what the essay could do and what nonfiction could do. Yeah. Um, and, and how, how sort of um, malleable and versatile it is as a form and the possibilities and her, her notion of granite truth and rainbow truth and this sort of rainbow mm. truth is, is, 
feel something that I'm chasing. And I, I feel that the essays I, I enjoy reading now, I feel that they must be influenced in some way by this, or I feel it just underpins everything we yeah. think of about, about writing essays. But um, so I, I really love Leslie Jameson. Um, I'd say Cheryl Strayed, some of her her pieces um, that she writes in her Dear Sugar advice column become like little mini essays on, mm -hmm. on life and, and um, just living. Um, and um, Leah Papura, who is um, very much a poet, her essays are beautifully, densely poetic. So I think mm -hmm. I'm quite influenced by that or maybe not influenced, but it's like she gives permission to say, you can, you can be a poet here. Mm. Um, you can you can sort of unleash the the full force of your um, image hunting desire yeah. in, into the essay here. Um, so I love her work, but I love Leslie Jameson for how she's able to braid unusual things together. And I think for me, this this shark question um, became this bigger issue because um, a lot of it was about landscape of Oman. Mm. This kind of strange sort of um trying to understand the motivations between between this kind of this violent act of the fishing but also this kind of deep community spirit as well and braiding that into um which i appreciate seems like a strange connection but the um so sev seven years ago eight years ago now um my baby boy was stillborn um mm. and i've wanted to find a way to write about this for a long time but it's a strange, difficult topic to write about, mm. and you're never quite sure how much anybody even wants to read about things like mm. this. Um, so it's kind of turning into it's it's braiding itself into the shark question, because the more I've researched about sharks, the more there's a lot of um, evidence to suggest oh. they they are quite emotional beings. They're not oh. these kind of cold, mechanical, yeah. um, sort of killing machines oh. that they are portrayed to be. And the poem that I was translating, the Austrian poem, very much explores the idea of the shark as this kind of mechanical, hmm. just kind of going about its sharky business in the sea. But, but I felt that was really, um, the shark was being unfair to itself in a sense. And um, I've discovered quite a lot about shark behavior, which suggests that they have feelings, they, they can indicate anger through their movements, they can, um, there are quite a few, um, divers who've developed very close oh. connections to sharks so there seemed to be this other angle that I could approach where trying to explore sort of like really deep violent loss inside oneself could almost mimic shark behaviors shark movements this kind of idea that you're cold on the surface about something but actually there's all this other stuff yeah inside. yes um and and so and even talking about it here feels like I'm simplifying a lot of what the essay is doing, but it's, it's, it's very much a sort of a braiding motion. There's yeah. strands tied together. And I think Leslie Jameson was the writer for me who showed me how you can do that. Mm. that you can take these completely incongruous things. And although talking about them in the abstract, you think, how can those possibly connect? The beauty and the, the, the real, the joy of writing a lyric essay is that you start to see it happening in front of your eyes. You think, mm -hmm this this image ties to that image and this one's crossing back over into here and um you don't even know until it's happening and it's it's quite a it's quite exciting and i think it helps you get inside your material in a very different way yeah i mean now you're talking about it it, it seems as if it couldn't really be anything else because it, it seems very kind of rich and raw and distilled and i yes. can't i can't think of another form that would suit it as well as the lyric essay Absolutely, because if you if you go to the long form, then you I think there's other questions that start to emerge from that. Although having said that, so I've got the Argonauts here. Uh -huh. We we both love this, um, and I think that has these sort of key questions which um, are expanded and expanded and expanded into the into a, a full length piece. But I think the fragmented way that Maggie Nelson writes enables it's almost like these little mini essays that yeah building blocks um but i think yeah the lyric essay it, it's got that distilled quality hmm. but at the same time that allows you to expand strangely yeah. so, so how will you know when it's finished well i've written the end um it's kind of i've written the beginning i've written the end um 
I've actually written the whole thing. It's just that the different sections, they need expanding. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so there's sort of messy parts in the middle which says a bit more here or yeah. something about yeah. shark movement. <laughs> Get more shark. <laughs> Be more shark. Um, so so it's it's really a kind of like a like a balloon kind of yeah. process. Rather than, yeah. well, it's not and I know exactly where it ends. It's just yeah. a kind of Yeah. Uh-huh. Um and then what will you do with it when it's finished? Um, well, I, I will be looking for somewhere to, to try and get it published. Yeah. Um, but like I, I said, I, I think anything over 7,000 words, it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. So I might perhaps cut bits of it to, to make it more appropriate for, for submissions. But it's, it's what ended up being evident from it is that there's a lot of consideration in the essay of the relationship between between human emotion and the environment and the outside world um, and and animal behaviors mm. and I started to think of other notes that I had for other essays um, after the Australian bushfires I had mm. something that I wanted to write about Kangaroo Island where I'd been about six years ago and a couple of other things and I started to think I feel like this might be a book of essays, actually. Oh, it's right. kind of relationship between the animal and the human experience yeah. of, of this madly changing world at the moment. Yeah. So, um, so for me, that's a bit of a departure because, as you know, I'm not a nature writer. Um, I'm a bit scared of nature writing, but it's it's almost like it's kind of nature is kind of coming yes. to us and saying, you know, pay pay some attention. Um, yeah. So, so I think it probably will ultimately be part of a book of essays. Right. So, um, but you could still submit it to different journals um, while, while thinking of it as being a collection, hopefully. Yes, absolutely. And I think in a way, seeing it or imagining it as part of a collection helps you see its framework a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's not an isolated piece. It's got, mm. it's going to talk to some other pieces as mm. well. So what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about submitting an essay to a journal? Um, I think I think the key thing is it's about there's no shortcut to finding out what's out there. You've got to get out, read the journals, explore online what's there. Some great starting points would be Granter, Paris Review, um, the Kenyan Review. I always love for its essays. Um, there's so many um, well creative nonfiction as um, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. suggests um, River Teeth. These are brilliant nonfiction well, not purely non-fiction, but journals mm. that really appreciate non-fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think getting a sense of what's there, mm -hmm. is your work a good fit for it? Is it what kind of markets um, and readership is going to be the, the sort of the most appropriate for what you're mm -hmm. doing? Anything that's got the non-fiction element, there's always that question of, is it more journalistic or is it more? Yeah. So I think understanding which side your, your work is, is mm. into, is important and then when you've when you've asked a few questions about it i think the other thing for non-fiction is it's it's timeliness are you yeah. on something that needs to be out there today because it's speaking of yeah. what we're experiencing now or, or yeah. something that's that will be relevant a little bit further down the line because it it is a, a lengthy process to get something mm -hmm. published mm -hmm. so get out there read um Journals are often very active on Twitter, so so trawl Twitter mm -hmm. to see what's there. Um, one experience of finding one journal will normally take you off in a lovely rabbit hole of, of, yeah. of others. And and when you've 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 had an explore and seen where your work would fit, then get the work into the absolute best condition it can be. Read it aloud. Get others to read it for you. Don't send it too early. Don't be too impatient. Mm -hmm. Apologize. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd finished this essay maybe two months ago and then I looked at it again. Oh. And, no, it's, it's not right. So have that, that time, that, that brilliant advice that Ali Smith um, once gave um, of letting it bake. Mm. It aside. We're all baking bread now, aren't we? We've all, we've all, um, <laughs> like flour, we're all baking bread. So all of the principles of baking bread, I think apply to our, our draft work, set it aside, let it prove. Um, and, um, and, and when it really is ready, send it out. Mm -hmm. um, a good cover letter, a strong, concise cover letter is important. Mm -hmm. Follow all the, the journal instructions. If, if they ask for a certain font, certain way of, of laying things out, do all of those things because yeah. it's so important to, 
yeah. to respect all of the those requests and 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 if you get a rejection just brush it off move wow. on do another, do another submission um i think someone told me once sylvia plath said she had always six six submissions out and six things in process or something wow. like this that's quite a lot um, yes um and i i I probably don't have more than about three things out at any one time. Mm. I think the minute something is rejected, just send it back out. Just find another yeah. another plan to send it. Don't yeah. sit there pondering. If you get feedback and and you think, right, I, I know what I need to do with it, maybe attend to that. That's a good idea. But very often rejection is not about a rejection of the work, but just that it's not the right piece for that journal at this time. So don't be disheartened. Um, just just keep on writing really yeah uh, and just send it out one at a time don't do a, a blanket submission of the same essay to several different places that's a tricky one isn't it because um i think a lot a lot of journals will say if they're okay with simultaneous right. and yeah. they're okay with it as long as you, you put that in your cover letter that it is and you you do withdraw it yeah if it's taken somewhere else I, then if they say that's fine it's fine yeah um quite a few because of the nature of nonfiction, because it often is quite pertinent to a particular experience or time frame or something um or an anniversary perhaps we, we tend to write yeah. you know we've, we've got some big historical anniversaries coming up this year so things will be quite particular if you're yes if it's if it's um if a journal says no simultaneous submissions mm. then i have to go with that but mm -hmm. um, okay Great, that was really interesting. Thank you very much. I look forward to reading the essay. Thank you for listening to this conversation. We hope you can join us again for the next one. You'll find more information about the books we've mentioned and the courses we run in the description box below.